Hey everybody, welcome to episode 5 of the Rust Review, the show where I go through the latest articles in the Rust community and let you know what I thought about them, tell you what I found interesting about each one. Uh, last time we were joined by my friend Alex Kaliris. Uh, he's not able to join tonight because it's really late UK time, but I uh, have a set of really interesting articles queued up to take a look at today, so let's get started. So... The first article that I'll talk about today is generic associated types in Rust 1.65. So this is an upcoming release of Rust that um, it's been in, in process for a while, especially this uh, generic associated types feature. Um, it's something that I've run into myself before uh, when dealing with callback functions specifically. So uh, generic associated types are a way to take associated types. Like you see, um, this is a type item is an associated type with this lending iterator trait that they've got uh, as an example on the article here. Let me see, there's actually a different article, the generic associated types initiative uh, that has kind of more detail about why this is a, a big deal and why uh, generic associated types are a thing. Uh, trying to make this generic, trying to um, have something like a callback function for your iterator, like a mapper function or something like that. The generic associated types uh, allow you to handle lifetimes along with your uh, associated types like this. Uh, so with being able to keep track of the lifetime, um, you can actually invoke the, the function as many times as you want because it has its own lifetime. Oh, and I didn't even pull up the right tab. There we go. This is the tab that I was looking at, the uh, Generic Associated Tabs Initiative site. And this is where it's talking through the iterator here. Um, I was trying to find a spot in the, the writing that I was looking at earlier, but definitely having some trouble there. So I'll go back to the original post. But that, that article or that Generic Associated Types Initiative uh, definitely has a lot more information about why they're uh, important, why they're interesting. There are some limitations with the uh, the standard standardized version that's coming through here. The limitations that they have around the the current implementation are seen as not important enough or not prohibitive enough to really prevent it from moving forward. Um, so one of the things that could go wrong is that. Um, in cases where you have um, higher ranked traits. So you're, you're compo composing or combining traits together and you have another trait that's implying a static requirement, um, then your generic associated type lifetime might be um, seen as needing to outlive static, which is not possible. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's something that can happen today. It's something that uh, even before generic associated types, it was possible to run into this problem with the Rust programming language. But it's something that you didn't see very often until generic associated types started being introduced. This is making it easier to run into this problem than it would be otherwise. Um, but they're saying that it's still rare. It's not something that will be a problem in most implementations. Um, and then also... Uh, traits with generic associated types are not object safe. So this is a set of requirements uh, that it's outlined in the REST reference. Let me switch over to that. Um, the REST reference has a, a, a section on object safety and what it means. Uh, but essentially, if it doesn't meet this set of requirements that's outlined here in the REST reference, then it can't act as a base trait that can be augmented with uh, other auto traits. So if you want to use that, then you can't use that with generic associated types right now because they're not object safe. So they can't act as that base trait that you're uh, enhancing with the auto traits. Um, in any case, despite that, I, uh, I definitely think that it's exciting to see this uh, kind of making its way towards standardization. It's something that really will enable more more abstractions, better abstractions that are easier to work with. And yeah, okay, that was the other thing. There are a few false positives that it's picking up in the borrow checker. So uh, false positives meaning things that aren't really a problem, but the, the borrow checker thinks they are, so it blocks it. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that makes Rust different, I think, because it goes the extra mile to make sure not only is it unlikely to have undefined behavior, it's actually uh, prevents any situation that could result in undefined behavior, even if not you're not using it in a way 
that would introduce undefined behavior, Rust goes the extra mile to prevent that from being possible. And that's a big part of why it's a more memory safe language and why it's um, more reliable, I think, than more higher level languages typically are. Um, so in any case, obviously you can see by my uh, difficulty in explaining generic associated types, before I started the video, I thought I understood them. And then when I jumped into trying to explain them, I realized, yeah, I don't totally get it yet either. That's definitely something that I want to dig into more. Uh, and hopefully the, uh, the rough edges around generic associated types are something that'll be uh, able to be smoothed over before uh, most people actually run into cases where they uh, actually uh, cause an issue. Uh, this is something that's been a long time coming and it's not fully done, but it's, oh well, gosh, six and a half years coming. I didn't realize it was quite that long. Um, so it's exciting to see it finally reaching this, this stabilization stage, even if uh, it's not perfect. So the next article I want to pull up, um, this one is from the Rust Foundation blog, uh, and it's written by Fulkert DeVries. He's an embedded software engineer at uh, Tweed Golf. They're a software consultancy in the Never Netherlands, and they're a member of the Rust Foundation. Uh, and so he guest posted here on the, uh, the Rust Foundation blog to talk about implementing a network time protocol client and server with the goal to first deploy it to Let's Encrypt, uh, to make it kind of public within the Let's Encrypt offerings, and then later on as a more broad publicly available service ev uh, everywhere. He first starts out talking about what NTP is, what the network time protocol is. It's a way to keep your devices synchronized to accurate time because uh, like he talks about clocks drift, they can drift uh, pretty meaningfully even uh, just in the space of a few hours. Time is typically kept track by atomic clocks, the real time, the, the source of truth for time. And so NTP kind of synchronizes regularly with the atomic clock information to correct that drift uh, before it becomes noticeable. Uh, and the reason that, it, that it's so important is that it's a really foundational part of the internet and how TLS certificates and security is built around. So if somebody could change the time or you take advantage of imprecise time because of clock drift or um, something like that, then uh, you could trick the system into believing that an outdated certificate is still valid and trust something that it shouldn't be trusting. It's definitely a really important part of the internet, but there's not a lot of safe implementations here. And that's what the Prosimo project that uh, this project, this NTP service is a part of, uh, that's what their, their overall goal is. So their goal is to provide memory safe implementations for pieces of software that run the internet wherever we can. Using Rust to re-implement things uh, based around the spec. So they actually use the original uh, NTP spec here. Some of the other uh, services that are out there don't follow the spec exactly. And so that was one of the distinctives of this project and uh, using Rust to make that uh, more memory safe. So this Rust code that makes it hard or in some cases impossible to do things that would open up the kind of uh, security vulnerabilities or um, unstable behavior that you see in other environments. He, he talks about why Rust and he talks about how he modeled the implementation in Rust. So see where in the article, there it was. Yeah. So he's talking about how they built it with this core, this NTP proto module at its core. Um, that is just essentially pure functions that are easy to test. Uh, this is a strategy that I like to use a lot too. Uh, functions that have clearly defined inputs and outputs. They don't have side effects that impact things outside of the inputs and outputs. Um, they're deterministic, easy to set up in a unit test and pass in mocked uh, dependencies and things like that. Um, so basically what they did was they, they returned instructions for the kind of network calls or clock modifications um, that they need to execute each time that they need to update. Um, so it follows the, the functional core imperative shell kind of style um, that I think was made popular by Gary Bernhardt. This is a, a classic talk that he gave back in 2012 called Boundaries, um, which really talks about the functional core, the, the pure deterministic core, and then uh, layers of more and more unpredictability outside of it as you introduce real world concerns to your solid functional core. And so I, uh, I like that strategy a lot for um, structuring my applications in a way that 
makes them easy to test. And uh, he stru- they structured it with this core that gives a description of the operations that need to be performed. Um, for network communication, they, they went low level with it. They actually went down to uh, Unix sockets because um, Unix sockets provide more accurate send and receive timestamps, he says. But um, you've got to configure the socket with functions from LibC. But LibC itself is really unsafe, like they're saying. It's, it's not built with the same kind of memory model that Rust is. Uh, and it doesn't have really comprehensive documentation. So um, they, they dug into LibC and figured out how to contribute to it in a way to make it more safe, to give it a safe async version um, of timestamping there so that they could go ahead and make use of the Unix timestamps. Uh, And then manipulating the system clock wasn't very straightforward either. They found that uh, it's not exposed by the standard library. Uh, So again, they had to drop down to LibC. uh, But in this case, it was a more safe operation. So they were able to do that successfully. Um, So he calls out some of the significant libraries that are in use there. He talks about how it's using uh, Tokyo. Yep, there it is. the async runtime, the clap to define uh, command line interfaces. Um, so it's it's all familiar tools that they use to build this uh, service. And it seems like everything went really smoothly. It's smoothly enough that they are more reinforced in their um, affirmation of Rust. They really uh, this felt like this confirmed their choice of Rust to provide these memory safe implementations to, to kind of meet the uh, the goal of the Prosimo project. Um, Prosimo is a project or a, a initiative, I guess, from the Internet Security Research Group that contracted with uh, Tweed Golf to do this. So it's exciting to see um, some of our internet backbone uh, being improved or, or rebuilt in ways uh, that are more reliable and safe. And I know Rust uh, has some pretty great performance characteristics to go along with all this too. That was one of the things we talked about in the last episode was how it really, uh, the performance is a side benefit. It's exciting. It's great. But the real goal here is the safety and the stability that, and the, the protection from security issues that this provides. Uh, next up, I am going to switch to something a little bit different, something uh, that comes more from the community that I have a lot of experience with. Uh, as a developer, I, I started out in the Python uh, and Django ecosystems uh, and then moved to React and Node uh, and eventually TypeScript as well uh, for a lot of my career. And uh, in recent years, I've started to move away from it, started to move more towards Rust and Go and languages like um, that that are more low level Uh, But I still have a lot of appreciation for TypeScript and the ecosystem that's built up around it. And um, at the recent NextConf that uh, was just held uh, last week, I think it was, I think it was last week, um, they announced TurboPack, which is their REST-based successor to Webpack. So uh, Webpack is a bundler. It is a uh, project that will take your JavaScript application and package it together in a way Um, that can be smoothly loaded by a browser or it targets other environments like Node and things like that too, kind of um, giving you a distributable package uh, that you can execute on different platforms like the browser. And uh, part of it is uh, transpiling JavaScript uh, to enable new features uh, that are uh, not yet widely available uh, by default built into browsers, but can be enabled through polyfills. So, uh, that was one of the things that Webpack did, but also kind of combining and chunking files and organizing them for efficient retrieval on the web. Um, so Webpack has been uh, more and more just increasingly a uh, ubiquitous tool in the uh, the web development, especially the front end engineering uh, space. But it's it's kind of old and it's kind of slow and. Uh, there was recently a, uh, a new tool called V-Day that uh, is also written with TypeScript uh, that has, I think, some REST components or elements, but it's mostly TypeScript um, that was quite an, a speed improvement over Webpack, uh, but not nearly as dramatic as this new REST-based solution. Uh, and one of the big deals about this is that it's developed by um, the original creator of Webpack. So it, the it, he didn't do it himself. He led a team, but Tobias Coppers uh, 
led this team that worked on the next generation turbo pack uh, repo. And they said that each time uh, in this, the work that they've been doing for Vercel, they, they kept finding enormous improvements whenever they tried replacing a JavaScript based tool with a Rust based tool. Um, so he talks about how uh, migrating away from Babel uh, ended up speeding things up uh, 17x, <laughs> which is amazing. And then uh, Terser, uh, the minification that kind of uh, reduces the size of payloads as they go over the wire, uh, sped up by six times, uh, which is kind of amazing. But the results that they ended up with in Turbo Re or Turbo Pack are just amazing. So already Vita was was radically faster but it's 10 times faster than V-Day and 700 times faster than Webpack, which is just astonishing. And then even on larger applications, they say, that actually increases the magnification. The larger the project, the better the benefit that you get from this Rust-based packager, um, often 20 times faster than V-Day, which is just amazing. To explain this performance, he talks about why it's so fast. What architecture does it use to, uh, to make this happen? So it's built on Turbo, which is an open source incremental memoization framework for Rust. Um, they have an explainer here uh, that talks about how Turbo works, but it's an incremental build tool, uh, essentially. And the, the goal was to never have to repeat yourself, never have to do something the same, the same thing twice. So this incremental memoization framework for Rust uh, caches the result of any function. So when the programs run again, functions won't be rerun unless those inputs have changed. So this, this kind of granular architecture, uh, it allows you to skip large amounts of work uh, at the function level uh, to not redo what you've already done, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, I haven't used Turbo before, but I've definitely used memorization libraries before, and they can definitely provide a, a pretty amazing kind of in-memory cache for uh, your functions. So uh, I took a quick, quick glance at the Turbo Pack code, and it's using some familiar crates. It's using Tokyo. It's using SWC internally. It's using Surde and the next test framework. One thing to call out, though, is that the uh, the Turbo Repo team or Turbo Pack. Uh, I keep saying Turbo Repo because that's another one of the projects from the same team. <laughs> but Turbo Pack Team, they borrowed heavily from the Parcel Projects architecture. Parcel JS is a bundler in uh, JavaScript that has had incremental building um, from the beginning. And so uh, one of the contributors to this Turbo Pack project um, acknowledged that that was definitely an inspiration for them here. Uh, and then also uh, they called out the Salsa incremental compilation project in Rust. So uh, it's it's an impressive feat that they pulled off here. It's going to be a big impact to front-end engineers, but I think the adoption is not going to be without its challenges. Uh, JavaScript developers are used to writing plugins for their tools in JavaScript and learning, the, learning Rust and its uh, interesting syntax and lifetime tracking isn't easy. It's definitely going to take some time before we see the same kind of plugin ecosystem form around TurboPack um, that the Webpack project has enjoyed for a long time now. But I think the, the benefit here, this 700x improvement is going to be quite a motivation to, to inspire people to pick up Rust and to learn it more. It's, it's really um, spreading at a rapid pace in a lot of different ways. Sticking on the topic of JavaScript for a few more moments, uh, I wanted to talk about the Boa JS project. They shared a post um, recently and uh, talking about uh, kind of the potential applications for their project. Uh, Boa is an experimental JavaScript lexer, parser, and compiler written in Rust. And in the recent post, they talk about using the library to allow third parties to extend the behavior of your project. So uh, they talk about how uh, Rust, since it's a compiled type safe language, uh, allowing your untrusted users to extend the behavior uh, can be challenging because it's tricky to change or extend a statically compiled program at runtime. Uh, and then also a lot of people who want to extend behavior are already familiar with things like JavaScript. And so it presents a really uh, easy environment for them to jump into and uh, start doing some scripting. This project, the BOA project, provides a runtime environment for Java 
JavaScript inside Rust that is safe and also gives you a lot of ways to, to interoperate. So um, you, you'll you use it first by creating an execution context here. So uh, you'll create this context, which is a, a BOA thing. Uh, and this allows you to configure the interpreter that will run the untrusted code. You'll work with these garbage collected JS value uh, instances. So because JavaScript is garbage collected by default, um, we'll need this runtime environment that, that JavaScript will be executing within to be garbage collected as well. And if you want to work in uh, in your Rust code, work with the JavaScript code, or from within the JavaScript code, make calls out to the Rust code, um, you need to have an interface that can describe this in a way that is safe and reliable inside Rust and also garbage collects the way that you expect in JavaScript. Uh, and so that's what they've they've created here. This uh, JS value instance is the, the basic part of it, but then... Uh, they have even more like a full-fledged foreign function interface uh, through a class uh, that you can instantiate, which manages those garbage collected implementations of uh, JavaScript's object-oriented patterns. So things that you don't typically see um, in the REST world, you can, uh, but are really common paradigms in the, the JavaScript world, you can emulate through this class uh, trait. So that allows you to work with it in JavaScript uh, in a really natural way. So here um, they've got a, a new person that you're creating in JavaScript, and then you're calling the say hello method on that person. Uh, but this is actually calling Rust code from within JavaScript. Uh, so it really is a fluent foreign function interface that uh, goes further than some of the other kind of JavaScript engines that I've seen um, in other contexts. So being able to interact with your REST code in idiomatic ways and being able to interact with the JavaScript code that your plugin writers have presented uh, in an a idiomatic way from within REST is definitely a powerful feature. I, I see the value here. I see why this is exciting. If you have a project where you want to allow users to extend behavior, but uh, you want to do it in a safe way that uh, doesn't turn your your beautiful, pristine, memory-safe REST program into uh, Swiss cheese <laughs> holes uh, with uh, security issues everywhere, then something like that uh, makes a lot of sense. All right, so next up, I have a post from Alex Gaynor. And uh, Alex is someone who I have followed for a long time now. Um, he was active in the Python community back when uh, that was my forte. And uh, I've been following since, following him uh, probably since back in 2008. Uh, throughout that time, he's done a lot of really awesome things. Uh, he served as the director of both the Django and the Python Software Foundations, currently specializing in security and software resiliency and he recently posted this article where he describes a problem with interoperability between Rust and Python, uh, specifically regarding Python's buffer protocol uh, and Rust's memory model there. So the Python buff buffer protocol he describes is a set of Python or a set of APIs which allow Python objects to expose their backing memory so that zero copy inter interoperability is possible. So basically working with references and not changing ownership, not copying memory regions. And you can use this to share memory between um, like he gives an example of an Im image parsing library or NumPy. Oh yeah, even like multi-dimensional arrays and, and different things like that. So he's, he goes with a simple example here, uh, but he introduces the idea of data races. This is one of the core concerns when you're working with multi-threaded code. So to prevent a data race, um, well, let's first see. Uh, yeah, he says data races are a type of race condition that happens when a write and a read or write to the same address occur from different threads without synchronization. So uh, in Python, generally you have the global interpreter lock, which is the synchronization method for multi-threaded Python. You can also use things like atomic operations or Rust has uh, multiple different synchronization methods, things like uh, mutexes or RW locks or things like that. In any case, the global interpreter lock in Python would typically prevent the kind of data race that we're talking about here. Uh, but since this buffer protocol allows C extensions, which is where Rust fits in here because it acts uh, like a C extension in this case, it allows C extensions 
to clear the the GIL when they're processing buffers. So the yeah, therefore the read and write star buffer could be coming from a C extension or a Rust extension, uh, which has released the GIL. So now we don't have any synchronization. We have the possibility of undefined behavior. That safety that you love about Rust is now gone. He he talks about how Rust changes this a little bit from uh, the from C itself. Uh, because Rust introduces this notion of soundness, which is being sound is definitely more strict than just C's aversion to undefined behavior. So C behavior is generally about runtime, but soundness is about hypothetical, projected, how it could be used regardless of what's actually happening right now. I, I love the way that he uh, introduces this. He says, a function is sound if it's impossible to trigger undefined behavior with any combination of arguments it takes. It goes the extra to make sure there's no way to call it in a way that uh, can cause an undefined behavior. And that's um, the core of soundness. That's where languages like Java fall over because there are ways to trigger NPEs, uh, the bane of any Java developer's existence. Uh, there are in Go also. Go is not a sound language. There are plenty of ways to get yourself uh, a null pointer uh, exception there. The challenge when you're interoperating with these Python buffers is that uh, you can't really represent them in Rust in a sound way currently. So he talks about how we've got a Python buffer. We want to represent that data in, in Rust. Um, so the, the type that he was talking about would most re most uh, accurately be represented as a, a U8 reference like that. But because of concurrent rights, this is unsound. But you can't make it a mutable uh, U8 because the, the buffer protocol doesn't prevent one or it doesn't limit you to just one mutable buffer uh, like Rust does. So Rust makes sure that you can only have one mutable reference at a time. Python provides no such security there. So it's because Python has such a source code level uh, concern around soundness that it it makes sure that you can't use it in a way that shoots yourself in the foot. Um, there is a library, PyO3, that he calls out that is a, uh, a library for binding to the CPython API, uh, and it presents things in a read-only cell, uh, which makes it safe and sound. Uh, but if you want to actually, uh, like he says, pass some bytes into a REST library to parse them or do any kind of other processing, um, you're, you're not going to get a method call that expects a read-only cell. Any kind of library work that you're going to do with that value is going to expect the, the actual U8 instead of the read-only cell for it. You'd have to copy it in order to use it in the way that you expect, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the Python buffer protocol. Uh, if you're copying it around, the zero copy benefit goes away. There really, he says, is no way to have it all. <laughs> you have to pick uh, from efficiency, interoperability, and sound this, but you can't have all three in this situation. He has some ideas for uh, how you might be able to improve this, but it's definitely a deep issue. It's something that he invited more discussion on. He wants to hear, to hear more ideas about how we can uh, make this uh, possible because Rust is becoming more and more prominent. It's becoming more and more uh, widespread and visible. Um, just before I went on uh, to the stream today, I saw uh, Wired post a big article about the viral spread of Rust. So it is uh, growing rapidly. It's interoperability with Python is becoming a bigger thing. Uh, it's becoming a big thing, obviously, in the JavaScript or TypeScript community, like I've been talking about. So it's everywhere. So little problems like these are, are going to become more and more important over time. So I'm glad Alex is calling out the need uh, for some more attention here, and hopefully we can find better solutions for things like this. Uh, let's shift to something a little more beginner friendly. So this article is from uh, Gintz Dramanis. I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly, but he is a technical editor, editor for uh, Seracal, a software consultancy that specializes in areas like fintech and the blockchain and machine learning. Um, he re recently posted this article, this uh, great beginner article, which is an overview on enums and the various ways that you can perform different pattern matching with them. And enums are a feature that I think gets uh, is, is underappreciated. It doesn't get as much 
much attention that I as I think it should. Uh, and I have felt the pain of working in languages like Go or TypeScript that only have uh, rudimentary or no support for enums. Uh, TypeScript has some support, but there's no real pattern matching, and Go's support is even less uh, complete there. Uh, there's no pattern matching uh, at all. There is a, a match or a switch statement, but it's not exhaustive, and so there's no way to know if you've handled all the potential cases. And so that is something that I've gotten used to with uh, languages like Haskell or OCaml or uh, things like that. I've gotten used to that exhaustiveness guarantee. I've gotten used to being able to destructure objects contained within enums uh, in a way that you can't do in Go or TypeScript or things like that. And so it's a really powerful feature. It, uh, it enables you to describe things in a, a very clear way, a very natural way without resorting to uh, giving objects a type parameter or things like that. Uh, in fact, when you serialize enums to J uh, JSON, um, you have the option to give it a type pr parameter, which is how you would kind of do it in a language like TypeScript. You'd use a discriminated union. But in any case, they're much more powerful in a language like Rust. And this article does a great job of introducing um, how they can be used in these more uh, sophisticated ways, I think. Like I said, one of my favorite features, Alex mentioned uh, in the last episode that it was one of his favorite features also. Definitely, if you are not familiar with the different ways that you can pattern match, so not just within the match statement, but also within if statements or, yeah, they've got a lot of just different variations on how they can be used here. And then the, the underscore there for your catch-all default case. Rust's usage of them uh, kind of feels similar to Haskell or languages like that, that I really came to love uh, enums in. Uh, and it provides some built-in, uh, like the option and result enums that are really powerful, especially the result enum with that syntactic sugar around the question mark to um, kind of bubble up uh, error cases that it's just really smooth. And I, I miss it in every other language that I work in. <laughs> So if you're if you're less familiar with enums or the different ways that you can use these pivotal language constructs, <laughs> or if you're just starting out and uh, you want to make sure that you don't have any gaps, like I, I've definitely found little cases here and there that, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, definitely check out this well-written and detailed article and shore up your knowledge of enums. Something else from the Haskell ecosystem uh, that I kind of miss in this world is uh, property-based testing, or in Haskell it's called Quick Check, and there are libraries in other languages like OCaml, and uh, I think there's even some TypeScript support too uh, for doing a similar thing here. So it's kind of like fuzz testing, and he he talks about the difference between uh, property-based testing and fuzz testing. Uh, but first off, the author here is Sergey Potapov. Uh, and he's a Rust and Ruby developer and a Linux fan based in Berlin. So his article here is around uh, using the arbitrary trait from the arbitrary library. And that was something that I hadn't heard of before. Uh, he describes it as one of the most underrated Rust crates because it gives you a way to randomly generate properties based on just a sequence of bytes. So you've got a random seed and you can generate any type by iterating over and generating new random seeds and, and resulting new random kind of fuzzed types. Um, you can test more variations than you would typically be able to think of or typically be able to write out by hand in your tests. The distinction that he draws between property-based testing and fuzzing uh, they're similar, but he says fuzzing is more of a long-term thing. He says it can even last months. Uh, I've not done fuzzing testing that comprehensive before, but property-based testing is intended to be in your unit test suite. So they're intended to go quickly and not take forever to run. You're not going to get every case every time, but you define a length of time that you want it to run within, uh, and it generates random cases within that time constraint. So Eventually, as you're running your test suite over and over, uh, you'll test a lot of different variations of input that you might not have thought about before. So he talks about how property-based testing is really good for these kind of cases. So serialization and deserialization, um, converting between uh, domain models and DTOs, so transforming data, transforming your data for persistence to save to the database or things like that. He taught, he introduces this uh, model here, the vehicle, where it can be converted to a vehicle record for persistence in the database uh, and then back to a vehicle. And he writes a, a unit test for this. He points out that, yes, the test is correct. It's not very exhaustive. And there are some cases that weren't tested here that 
we would want to include uh, t- to make sure that every variation is covered. So the tip, the standard approach would be to just write some more tests, copy and paste, <laughs> change the little variations. But with this arbitrary library, with the ability to derive anything based on a random seed, um, it makes it a lot easier to cover these kind of test cases with just one test here. So he uses a library called uh, ARB test to accomplish this. Looks like it's still pretty early on. There's also another crate prop test that uses the same thing behind the scenes. It uses arbitrary behind the scenes as well. His example is based on this ARB test that, that allows him to develop define the length that he wants it to run. So he's going to let it run 200 milliseconds. Uh, and in his case, yes, he discovers this new panic. <laughs> Panic is the worst thing that can happen in a Rust project, but he discovers this with the fuzz testing without having to write those individual cases. Uh, And then the cool part is that it prints out the seed so that you can then use the seed to deterministically reproduce the same case. So it failed here. You don't know why it failed, but you can generate the same data with the same random seed and then instrument your code to figure out what went wrong which is really cool. I definitely like that approach. Uh, He's just automatically deriving the arbitrary trait that powers this ARB test library. Um, So he doesn't even have to write the implementation itself, which uh, I love that. It it feels kind of magic. It feels like I'm not sure how it's able to uh, easily derive these structs based on these random seeds uh, without any information from you. And I assume there are probably some cases where that'll fall over, but it does look so easy to to layer into your code and to start ma- taking advantage of where it makes sense. And the example case shown shows how he can you can save a lot of time and uh, get the same results without a huge amount of effort. The last thing that I will bring, uh, pull up today uh, is a video. So this is a video that came out of the uh, the Rust Lens uh, meetup, which uh, Lens is in Austria. That's right. So Tim McNamara here, he is the author of Rust in Action. Uh, and he's very active in the open source communities, uh, including the New Zealand Open Source Society. Uh, and he recently gave this talk uh, at the Rust Lens meetup in Austria, where he does a deep dive into uh, boxes, heaps, and stacks uh, from the perspective of a newcomer to the Rust ecosystem. Um, he, he starts going down the, the rabbit hole with, okay, what is a box? Uh, but then in order to really define a box, you need to define a whole bunch of other things. So he talks about, okay, a box is related to a pointer type for a heap allocation for an own value of type T. And so uh, now you've got all these uh, new terms that you need to define in order to really understand what a box does. And he goes in depth into those terms. Um, he digs into a lot of things that you might have missed as you were onboarding to Rust. I definitely had. Um, for example, I didn't realize that a box was the foundation for collection types, like a vec and a string, essentially. So it was definitely a great talk. Uh, it's posted out on the Rust YouTube channel, and uh, he demonstrates basically the different types of references and how to work with them. Um, he talks about how the Rust compiler um, coaches you through the kind of problems that boxing solves. It's really just a, a great detailed and fun. Like he's a really good natured uh, speaker and uh, is really open to feedback from the crowd. Uh, but he does some live coding here to demonstrate how it works. And uh, it's really foundational information uh, that if you've been working in a high level language like Python or JavaScript or uh, something like that for a long time, uh, some of this might be totally new to you, like managing memory regions, uh, differentiating between the stack and the heap, and why is the stack so much faster? That uh, can be kind of mystifying to newcomers. And so this talk is a great way uh, to get more familiar with how those things fit together and what, what those things are doing for you, um, how a box can allow you to uh, work with dynamic implementations of a trait where you don't actually know what the size is, so you can't put it on the stack. And so a box helps you allocate it dynamically on the heap in a way that allows you to um, use those dynamic implementations uh, as if they were the concrete type using dynamic dispatch. It's uh, really a powerful feature of Rust that kind of exposes some of the things behind the scenes that you don't often think about. Uh, but they're really important, and that's part of the the uh, amazing tool set that Rust gives you to manage things. 
that are really abstracted away for you in other languages in a way that can be really limiting in a way that causes a lot of problems at times. So definitely take a look at this talk. Uh, in anything on the Rust channel, there's a lot of great content that's posted here on a regular basis, but this in particular caught my attention because it filled in some of the, uh, those details that I missed, the gaps in my knowledge as I was getting on board with uh, Rust. Uh, I'm finding a lot of that as I go along, and I love great talks like this that share the information. I think that's it for today. Uh, I really enjoyed going through all the articles and uh, kind of trying to find how to explain them. Uh, like you saw, I had some trouble explaining generic associated types at the beginning. Uh, and so that helped me realize that's a gap. I, I thought I understood GATs and I really don't. So I need to go back and brush up on them more. Uh, and so the more articles that I sit down and really summarize and, and try to figure out how to explain them to others, the better I understand uh, these topics that I'm digging into. Um, I'm also planning on doing some live coding this uh, Friday to m continue moving forward the, uh, the WebSocket implementation that I've been working on. Uh, I'm going to be introducing a Redis channel solution for uh, horizontal scaling so that you can send messages from one instance of your application to another instance, uh, which is really useful for things where you have a user posting to a, a chat group and anyone else who's currently subscribed and listening to that chat needs to get the messages. Um, so stay tuned for that. And I should be back next week on Friday, uh, planning to have Alex join me again uh, on Friday next week. So uh, be sure to watch out for that too. Thanks a lot for watching. And uh, you can find me, I've moved from Twitter to Mastodon now for obvious reasons. So uh, find me on Mastodon. You can find me in uh, Discord on uh, the Rust channels that are out there. Also some TypeScript channels, the, the Denver dev uh, community there. Um, you can find me at Formidable. Formidable Labs is the consultancy that I work with. And uh, we have more and more people that are excited about Rust and have gone through our internal training course for it. And uh, are loving the opportunity to work with it more. Uh, and we're also working with other languages. My current project right now is a Go project, and I really enjoyed branching out into uh, different directions. So if you need some help with a project, reach out to Formidable, and we'd love to give you a hand. Thank you for watching, and hope you have a great day.